Okay, so in, in Song of Songs, I love how it speaks about um, the, the story of the bride and the story of the bride's leadership over the church and, and how it has all those um, the spiritual principles in it. And I also love uh, the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, I love the whole Bible, but I love the Sermon on the Mount. This one really impacted me. And it speaks about this type of maturity as well. So we're going to dedicate this uh, portion of lecture to speak about this, and then we're going to go over um, impact and leadership and ministry again. And so if you look at Matthew 7, 24, it says, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew and beat on the house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who has built his house on the sand. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell. And great was its fall. And so what we see here is another, um, it's another angle or another layer of what spiritual maturity looks like through the eyes of Jesus. And he relates it that spiritual maturity is this unshakable foundation. That when perseverance, when difficulty, when challenge, when suffering, when ministry and responsibility, everything he's going to go over, relationships, money, uh, anxiety, worry, when Jesus is our rock solid foundation, then no matter what comes against us, we will never shake. And so this is a really, really practical way of seeing what does a mature person in Jesus look like. In the Sermon on the Mount, it also speaks about um, the word perfect. And you'll see the word perfect a couple of times in the New Testament. But what that means is fully whole, which also means fully mature. It's full. And so he says this a couple of times here. Um, one of them is actually related to loving your enemies. And he says those that love their enemies and blesses them, they'll actually be perfect like God. And then they also say that in James 3, that if you can control your tongue, then you will be perfect, which in that language meant fully mature. You're fully the bride of God that God's called you to do, like be, like in Ephesians 4. All right, let's go into, I'm going to break down the overall structure of Matthew, um, the Sermon on the Mount. So if you go to Matthew 5, I'll give the context of this. You'll see something that are the eight Beatitudes, uh, which, good, uh, some of you are uh, familiar with. But then if you're not familiar with, I'll, I'll, um, I'll just remind you or tell you. It's these Beatitudes are the blessedness of someone that walks with the virtue of Jesus. And so blessedness means um, it's a trait where it's essentially saying this is an attribute of God. This is how God lives. And blessed is the person that lives like this. And so it's a really powerful statement uh, broken down in the virtues of who God is, of who Jesus is. And then as you go through Matthew 5, and then you go all the way to uh, Matthew 7, and then it ends, uh, it ends before 8, that whole section there, um, after the Beatitudes, is what it looks like day to day when it's broken down. What does these eight virtues of Jesus look like when someone mistreats me? When someone is walking in darkness, when I'm anxious, when I'm praying, when I'm fasting, what do all of these, what do all of these attributes look like in relationships of judgment, of uh, me speaking to somebody that doesn't want to listen? And it, it breaks it down um, very clearly. And so I want, I want to let you know that. So just in case you want to read it, you'll know what this is all about. It's like these, I kind of, you could liken these virtues of Jesus to be these budding virtues that the Shulamite talks about in her garden. She says, let's go down to the garden and look at the vineyard 
which you'll notice that the vineyard has many, many parables in the Bible. It represents God's flock, God's church, represents the nations of the world as God's church is growing. And then he says, abiding in the vine, all of those kind of uh, metaphors and parables. But then he says, for the, let's see if these budding vines are, are blossomed yet. And so these are like the budding virtues on this vine of of poor in spirit, of being of mourning, of being meek in verse uh, chapter five, verse six, hungering and thirsting, of uh, for being merciful, for being pure in heart, for being a peacemaker, for being persecuted in righteousness. All of these are the budding virtues of a of a disciple of Jesus growing deeper in love with Jesus. And so the first beatitude is poor in spirit. And that's the one that is the entrance point of everything else. It doesn't mean that if you just get that, you'll have everything else. You have to, you have to mature in everything, right? If you're poor in spirit, it doesn't mean you love your enemies. It doesn't mean that you're a light uh, of evangelism. It doesn't mean that you're a stewardship of God's money. It means that you're poor in spirit. But you can't walk out in spiritual strength Unless you're poor in your physical strength, uh, not like your, like your muscles, but then and let, you have to work in God's strength, not your own strength. You have to lean inside of him, and that's why it's so important. All right, so on this, this is, um, this is all the stories that I looked up in the Bible for um, being poor in spirit. I didn't realize how much I like this thing until it broke off. <laughs> now I can't put my paper here. All right, so I want you to look through it. And then on page two is where it has Old Testament examples of uh, men that were poor in spirit. And so it goes over Noah, Elijah, Elisha, Moses, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Isaiah, all these stories. Um, I love, I love these stories. These are like, I could preach these stories all day, but um, it's not about what I like all day. So anyways, um, this, the next page is page three. And these are uh, godly women through the Bible that are poor in spirit. And how they, God used them in powerful ways to deliver the message of the Lord. God used them in powerful ways to give birth to these uh, children that were going to shake and shift the foundation of the planet. It talks about Mary and Mary Magdalene and Deborah, one of the judges in the Old Testament and prophetess. Uh, then the next section are the disciples of Jesus. And it shares... Um, uh, stories of where um, the disciples of Jesus were living out that beatitude of being poor in spirit. And then the last section of this is where it talks about how to deepen a lifestyle of living poor in spirit. And so it uh, talks about your prayer life. It moves into your purity with God, being intentionally choosing your purity with God. And then it, uh, the last section is boldly living a life of integrity with God. I'm actually going to choose one of these stories here, and it's going to be Elijah. Okay, never mind. My voice is really loud still. <laughs> even, when I'm, even when it's all messed up, it's still really loud. All right, so um, I'm going to make this softer. Um, okay, so Elijah, um, I love this story. Man, I'm about to share you this story. And it just rocks me how much Elijah leaned on the Lord in, in the midst of his, of his maturing. And you're going to see Elijah goes through the stages that the Shulamite went through. So let's start off in one place first. This is, um, if you want to know where I'm coming off of the outline, it's um, number two on page two. So it's, let's start off with James 5.16. So go ahead and turn there in your Bible. And this is the new t one of the New Testament references to Elijah, because there's a couple of them. Elijah was actually there on the Transfiguration, and uh, he was referenced uh, with Jesus um, another time as well, but uh, with John the Baptist. So he's, he's quite significant. Uh, James 5, uh, 16. So J James 5.16, this is the last uh, section of Jesus' brother wrote this book. After Jesus um, died, I believe he became a disciple. So I'm going to go through um, 
I'm going to skip ahead to um, a couple of uh, sentences. Verse 16. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and earth produced its fruit. And so there's a couple of key words here that I want to state. One is that Elijah was a man. And so even in the culture of the church right now, if you have a prayer meeting, usually there's a lot of women. Yes, see, you know that, right? And um, that's why I think this is quite significant that there's so many men here, actually. And um, normally we associate the devotion and the intimacy with Jesus with women. And then we associate only the provision and the, um, and the work and like things like that and the protection with men. But the poor in spirit, that belongs to God and all of his people, male or female. And what it's stating here too is that I sense that this is what God's actually going to bring forth in you guys here in this room. Like you guys here, look at me for a second. That's you. This is like Elijah is like a picture of you guys. I really sense this. He was, he was a normal guy, just a normal guy. He was set apart. <laughs> He, he, uh, sometimes he slept, sometimes he didn't, all right? So um, depends on what the Lord is doing. But that's the key word here too, is nature is like ours. And so sometimes when we think of these people in the Bible, we, we think of these superhumans. Well, one of the things about Paul, I think he was four feet tall. Is anyone four feet tall? That's how some of the, are you four feet tall? <laughs> I was like, well, you're like uh, almost my height. Oh, you're my height. You're taller than me, maybe. So, um, but they say a, a, a Paul might have been four feet tall too. And so we associate sometimes this grand spiritual individual, individuals. But when we look at them, they're just regular people like you and me. And there's something that Elijah did that was very important. He fervently prayed. He was non-stop prayer warrior. And that's not just for women, that's for men and women. And in this, in this context, it says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And that's for a woman as well. Because in, in the Bible, when it speaks of a man, it's also assuming the family. It's assuming the, the rest of the community. Because the men are usually the leaders in this time. And then so if the men are getting it straight, then they're going to be able to lead everyone else into what the Holy Spirit is saying in pray through prayer and even spiritual fervency. And so I want to go into um, the storyline here. He talks about in this next verse that he prayed it would not rain for three years and six months. And then when he prayed again, it rained after that period of time. And I want you to think about uh, just something hovering. It's like, I feel like the Holy Spirit's hovering over you guys. But um, I want you to think about your family. And I want you to think about what would happen to your community, your family, and your friends if you fervently prayed as a righteous man. Just think of the amount of vision God would give you. The amount of strategy, the amount of supernatural ability, the amount of supernatural leadership. You would be one of those people in your community and your family that's anointed by God. And even in my family too, now they try and introduce me to other family members. Because before I used to be the gang member. Before they used to introduce me to my family and they used to say like, oh hey, Tommy's here. So make sure you get your money put away. Make sure you get your stuff put away. Make sure you just don't pick on him or something. He might beat you up or something like that. And then so they would be like, make sure you guys love on him. Feed him food. If he eats your food, then just let him eat your food. And then just like that's the way they introduced me when I was like 17, 16 years old. And then now that I'm like in my 30s, they introduced me and they're like, oh, hey, Tommy's coming. And then they're like, oh. Then they're like counting their sins. They're like, am I going to do my Hail Marys? They're like, okay, what am I, did I purify my life? And then they're like, he might give a message, he might share. I'm just going to come over. I'm not going to, it's not like an event or anything like that. But they see that I'm anointed now. And that's what he has for you. 
and then I'm going to prophesy over you that your friends and family and your community, they're going to speak over you and they're going to say, oh, he's coming now. Bobby's coming now. Right? He's in the house. L3, Lord, he's coming now. He's going to be in the city. He's a missionary. God's anointed him. He's righteous. They're going to speak of you like that because your fruit is going to bear that. And it's going to be kind of awkward at first. Sometimes you just want to eat your squid, right? I just want to, sometimes I just want to hang out with my Filipino family and eat my squid. And then my Filipino family, they go, they love their Filipino, right? So then they bring out all the snails. (laughs) They brought the snails, they brought the squid, and they brought the pig ears. So I don't know how they got the snails, because when I came, they knew I like pig ears and they knew I like squid. I didn't tell them I like snails, but then um, somehow they always bring that. And I just want to sit down and I just want to eat my big fat squid. Because when I'm with Claudia, I I just don't order it. Because she looks at the squid with all its tentacles and its big fat eyeball and the black ink. And it's like this big. It's not like these little squids, which are still kind of crazy. But it's this giant squid. I look at it. And I go like, oh, I just can't wait to chew on that tentacle. I can't wait to cut that part of the eye and then just stick this one section of the head and stick it in my mouth and just chew it. Like, right? Adobo squid, right? And then I'm looking at the pig ears. And then there's some hair on the pig ears. And I'm all like, oh, there's a hair on the pig ear. When I stick it in my mouth and I eat the cartilage, it crunches so well. Like, I'm just like... (laughs) Yeah, right? My dad used to cook that all day. So um, it's like a comfort food for me. I only eat it once a year. Because one time I came back home to my family, and they asked me, what do you want to eat? And I said, I really want adobo uh, pig ears. And so they put it together. They put the soy sauce and all this stuff. And then they cooked it. And I, I had two boxes of pig ears and pig face. And then I was just chowing down on it. I landed from the airport, and I got to the house at 10 p.m., and my midnight dinner was pig ears and pig face. And I was just eating, and I was like, oh, it was so good. I ate half of it, half of the box. I woke up for breakfast, and I ate more of it. And then on my brunch, I ate the rest of the box. And then by lunchtime, I finished a box and a half of pig ears and pig face. All the hair and all the nasty stuff and all that stuff. And I was like... I walked over to my mom, and I said, uh, Mom, and then, she's like, what's wrong with you? Did you? Are you jet lagging? And I'm like, my heart hurts. And she's all like, why? It's those pig ears. I told you you shouldn't eat all those pig ears at once. And I said, but it's so good. And then she says, you need to stop eating that. And then I was old enough to go like, okay, just throw it away or give it to the dog or something. So then I stopped eating it. But that's what I wanted to do when, I was, when I'm with my family now, right? I just want to go eat some pig ears and squid. So then now I sit down, but then everyone's looking at me. They're like, and I'm like, okay, am I going to eat my squid today or tomorrow? I better get some pickup bag or something. And then they're waiting to see what the Lord is going to say. And I'm like, I'm not thinking about that right now. Like, I'm really thinking about the food. But that's what Elijah was like. These guys that were against God, not my family, but in the the context of the story, they were against God. And then when Elijah would come into the scene, they would freak out. They would go, wait, wait, wait. Why is Elijah here? Have you come to kill me? Have you come to strike me down? Because the anointing and the holiness was so giant on this man whose nature was like ours that he represented the Spirit of God. And let's go ahead and read about this guy. So let's go to 1 Kings 17. And I want you to, I want you to, as you're reading this, I want you to imagine yourself with him. And even the things that God's talking to you about. 1 Kings 17. All right, so I'm not going to go verse by verse, but I'm going to highlight a couple of things. And I'm not going to just read it out because some of you might fall asleep. So um, I'll just kind of tell the story of it. So Elijah's over here, and there's a huge drought in chapter 17. And then it goes over, and then he says, And Elijah of Tishbit, the inhabitant of Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, there shall be not dew nor drain these years except at my word. And he received that word from God. And he got that word through prayer. 
And so man, this man, Elijah, prayed all the time. He didn't move unless he saw God doing it, like what Jesus said. And then the word of the Lord came to him saying, Get away from here and turn eastward and hide by the brook which flows in the Jordan. And it will be that you shall drink from that brook. And I have commanded the ravens to feed you. And then he says, So he went and did according to the word. That's how Elijah starts out his story. He comes into this broken kingdom. He says, I have a word of rebuke, rebuke for you. God is going to hold back all of the rain and you won't even have dew in your plants until I say it. That's the introduction of Elijah. And then he goes over to this brook and then he says, Elijah, I'm going to send you over to this brook and I want you to only eat what the ravens give you. And he's praying. Right? This is what he's getting in prayer. It's a word of God, like many of us received in prophecy. And then he eats it, and then he stays by the brook, and he doesn't move until that raven feeds him. He doesn't move at all. He's not over there trying to do his own stuff, kill the kingdom, do all these things. He's sitting by the brook, waiting for the next word of God. That's a man that prays. A man that prays and a woman that prays doesn't move from that raven, doesn't move from that brook until God says, now it's time to go. So he moves in, he keeps on going. And then it says, the ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he drank from the brook and he stayed there because it's a drought, right? So he's by water. And then he stayed there until it happened that the brook dried up because there had been no rain. And so he's not worrying about what's going to happen with no rain. The land is cursed. They're, they're worshiping Jezebel and Baal. And it's a completely heathen nation. These are the Israelites. It's God's kingdom. They completely turned away from God. God's going to smite them and destroy them if they don't turn back to the Lord. And he's the prophet of the day. And then he's not worrying about this drought. He's not looking at the judgment of God over the people that are rebelling and killing babies and sacrificing their children all in the name of these false gods. And they're his people. This is, if you think about it, this is the Shulamite bride. These are the Israelites. This is the ones that God said, you are my people. And they've turned so far away from God, they're killing their children and worshiping God with, uh, with their blood. That's what happened to the Shulamite maiden. And God comes to them, just like you see in the challenges of the Song of Songs, and he starts, he starts bringing a word of, will you come back to me? Will you turn back to me, my bride, my Israelite, my church? And the only one that hears God right now in this specific context right now, besides 7,000 others, but he's a prophet, is Elijah. And he's not worrying about anything else except what he gets in prayer. And this guy's crazy if you don't know the story of Elijah. He's wild. He's not like some dude that just sits in a chair, then looks at a wall, and then just sleeps and wakes up and looks at a wall. He like, he's going to go against the prophets of the kingdom. He's going to go against the, the king, the Jezebel. Right now, this time, all the prophets of God are dead. This woman named Jezebel came, slept with this Israelite, took herself as queen, and took and uh, kidnapped and jailed all of the prophets of the Lord. And if you research the type of stuff that these wicked individuals did in those days, it's like Hitler. The type of things that the Philistines did when they captured their slaves was wicked. And now this Jezebel person's going around capturing all the prophets of God. And then she's doing all of these wicked things to them. So much so that he's the only one left that he knows of. And he's just coming at them, coming at them, coming at them. So I'm going to go move a little forward because there's this place where I really want to hit. So over the time, Elijah, he comes to this guy named Ahab, who's, uh, who's ruling over this place at this point. And then he has this discussion with him. And he says, the Lord wants your people, he wants everyone to come into repentance. He wants to, he wants to bring rain in the land once the repentance comes. And then so he, they're going back and forth. And he says, I challenge you to a showdown. I want you to bring your most powerful prophets of Baal. 
The people that you know the most that talk to your God, I want you to bring them to me. And then I want you to fill this Colosseum with every one of your people, all the leaders of your people, and then I'm going to show you that my God is more powerful than any of your fake gods. And so that's what they do. Just one dude, one dude, one dude, one man whose nature is like ours, who can't stop praying, who can't quit, who can't do anything else but the word of God on his life. That's the kind of bride that he is. That's the kind of person that he's matured to. He's so diligent in praying and listening to God's voice. He's going to go up all of these people that would kill him and say, I have the word of God. And he's going to challenge everybody by himself with the spirit of God. All right, so he goes over. So if you imagine this, they take this cow and then they put him uh, in front of everybody, this bull. And then they sacrifice him. And then they say, all right, all of you, prophets of Baal, you burn this bull up. Send fire from heaven and burn this bull up. And so they're, like, that's the context, right? I want you to think about this. Okay, you seen these cows here? Right? They're like kind of skinny. And then they're um, big, right? But there's a drought. So um, they're over here. And then imagine if you took one of these cows and you cut it in half. Now I want you to think about you getting a lighter and trying to light it on fire. That'd be incredibly difficult, right? That would almost be impossible. For you to light an animal that was just alive, that is now killed, that's bleeding and wet and sweaty and just all this nasty junk coming out of it, and now you're trying to light it on fire. It's, it's hard to do even if you have fire. If you had a burning fire, it would hard, it'd be hard to take logs over here and use that as the place where you start fire, even if you had it started already. So that's the challenge. Who's going to burn these bulls? Whose God is so real that these bulls are going to be lit on fire? That's the challenge here. And so Elijah's over here. He's doing it. And then the, God's not moving. This is what it does. In ver- and if you go to chapter 18, verse 26, it says, So they took the bull which was given to them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, Oh, Baal, hear us. And there was no voice, and no one answered. They leapt about the altar that they had made. So they started out uh, just crying out to Baal. Right? So if you can imagine all of these people here, they had this bull, and then they're crying out to God. They're saying, Baal, 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 burn this bull up and show everybody that you're God. And then nothing happens. So what does Elijah do, right? He goes in, or what did the other guys do? Actually, Elijah says this. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, cry aloud for your God is either meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. In one translation, it says he might be taking a poo. Like, is he relieving himself? So he's talking to all these prophets. He's this man covered in the strength of God. There's not an ounce of his own strength at this moment. He's completely anointed. He's standing before the Colosseum of these pagans that have turned away from Jesus. And he's, he's mocking them. The only thing he has is the word of God on him. He has nothing else. He's standing there and he's saying, what's happening? Is your God on the toilet? Is he asleep? Can he hear you? Maybe you have to be louder. And then he goes on and kicks it by himself. Because he's the only one that believes in God right now. No one else believes in him. There's no other strength. It's only him and Jesus and his prayer life. And then he moves forward and he says, so they cried out loud and then they got wild. You guys don't do this when you get wild, all right? They got wild. They cut themselves. And he was accustomed with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. So this isn't like a, you know, like an attempt to then like blood starting to seep. This is like a cut where it's gushing. They hit a vein. And now it's gushing out on the altar. And they're crying out to Baal, come and burn this bull up. And then they start doing this, right? 
And then they started going to this. And when midday passed, and they prophesied until the offering in the evening of sacrifice, but there was no voice, and no one paid attention. They started doing their ritual, gushing with blood, crying out loud for almost a whole day. And nothing happened. Not an ounce of, nothing moved, not even a tree. A tree didn't even do anything. Bird didn't even chirp, whatever. Nothing moved. There was no thunder, no lightning, no nothing. And then Elijah said this, right? This is why it's so powerful when you have a man of prayer. Because when you have a person of prayer, you have confidence, of that God has said something. And then he comes in. Now, he's, now it's his turn. Now he's like, all right, boys, I'm going to show you who God is. He gets up. I don't know what he does. He's skinny right now. He's actually hairy, if you didn't know that. And he's bald. So Elijah's bald and hairy. And he's probably skinny because he's not eating anything besides ravens and all this. And then so he gets up. I mean, he ate some other stuff too, but it's probably not that much. So it's a drought. So he gets up and he's all like, he comes in and he says, like Clint Eastwood. I don't know if he does it like Clint Eastwood, but whatever. He comes in and he says, come closer to me. Come closer. Come closer. He's going to say, I want you to watch what I do. And he said, he's like this. You know how a magician says, okay, watch, watch where you're at. Then he keeps you where he's at. Uh, because he has all these mirrors and fake stuff back here. And then he's all right, just stay there. Wait, hold on. Don't walk there. Well, stay over here. And then he's all like trying to make sure that nobody sees the junk that he's about to do here, right? Or if it's witchcraft, it's real witchcraft. But most of the case, it's illusion. What Elijah does is he says, come closer to me. I want you to see everything that I'm about to do right now. You just spent a whole day watching the most spiritually powerful people of your land cut their veins and gush blood and cry out, and your God is still on the toilet. I want you to see what my God's going to do. So he comes in. He says, come closer. And he replied, the altar was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones, according to the tribes of Jacob. It's so powerful. He's reminding them, you are the 12 tribes. He's reminding them as a word of God, you're like the Shulamite maiden. You're the one that I called out. You're the ones that I brought and crossed over the river. This is your storyline. Well, I started to feel it. I'm sorry, I really feel it. And then he gets it. He puts these stones, these 12 stones, and then the people of Israel are looking at it. And they're like, oh, wait, that's what we put as a, as a memory that God saved us from Egypt. When we were slaves to darkness, God pulled us out, and then he put this memorial that we were the stones, that this is, we'll always look at this and remember God saved us. And he starts putting these stones in, and you can imagine the Israelites looking at it, remembering what's happening here. And then he says, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. At this point, it's not Lord, it's Yahweh. It's, it's Yahweh. He puts this altar and he puts Yahweh on it. Because you, the word Yahweh is so holy, they just took sections of the alphabet of different, uh, different parts of it and put it together. And it, it wasn't even a real word. He's so holy, they don't even want to say his name. That's how holy he is. Because when he comes in your presence at this point, you're, you're, you're not, you're, there's no sacrifice of Jesus. You die. He's that holy. So they put, this is an altar to the Lord. And then he goes on and he says, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made a trench around the altar long enough for two sea seeds and put wood in order and cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood and said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And then he said, do it a second time. So he gets all this wood, and then he gets all these pieces, he gets buckets of water, and he soaks it in water. Completely covered in water. Maybe even being a reminiscent of Jesus, of the Lord splitting the Jordan River. Before they crossed over, and then they took over the kingdoms. And then he goes on, and then he says this, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. There's no there's no logic in Elijah right now. There's no, is this going to work? Is this going to be something that is going to turn into fire? He has the anointing of God on his life. And he's saying, this bull's going to burn. 
And it's going to defy everything that you know about the world. It's going to be a miracle of God that we just dunk this thing three times and it's overflowing with water now. That's what's happening with this picture here. And then it says, do it a third time and did it a third time. So the water ran around all the altar and he also filled the trench with water. So now the whole thing is trenched. It's like in a pool of water with a trench around it. That's how soaked this thing is. So now it's not just a, it's not just a dead bull. Now this thing is covered in water. It's covered in all this wet wood and it's covered in pieces. So it's even soaked even more. And then he comes in and then he says what he's going to do. And then he goes on, he says, and it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice. And Elijah, the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac and Israel, let it be known this day that you are the God of Israel and I am your servant. And I did all the things that's your word. That's a man that's poor in spirit. That's a man that prays. That's a man that doesn't do anything unless God says it. And then he looks at it, he, the way that he identifies God. He doesn't so Jehovah, Jireh. He says the God of Abraham, Isaac. The Israelites remember that's our, those are our fathers. He says the God of your wilderness. The God that took you when you're under the tree of the, the shade of the tree. The God that was with you when you were a shepherd. He cries out to them, and you can imagine Israel is in this place where they're, th they're, remind they're reminded of God. And they're looking at him, and they're like, it's, it's striking their hearts. He's prophesying their destiny to him in the same way that he did to the Shulamite maiden. And he's reminding them, you belong to me. You don't belong to Baal. You don't belong to Jezebel. You don't belong to any of these other pagans. You belong to me. I am the God of Abraham. I'm the God of your fathers. And then he goes on and he says, oh, oh he, he says, he goes on, where is it? Let it be known this day that you are the God of Israel. Your servant is done by your word. And then he goes on and says, verse 37, hear me, O Lord, hear me. That this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you may turn their hearts back to you again. And that's the cry that he has here. And then right when he says that, he, the fire fell down and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust. And look at this word. It lit up the water. There was so much fire. It licked up the trenches. It's, this is funny. I don't even know if it's part of it. But I used to like ramen soup, right? And then I used to break it when it's dry. And then I used to put a bunch of powder on it. I used to lick it and then put powder on it. And then so that it would st stuck to the dry ramen. And then you would have all of this ramen powder on the plate. And then I would lick it. So that all of the powder of the ramen soup was gone. Right? Did you guys ever do that? Okay, so. <laughs> Anyways. All right, all right, leave me alone. Okay, so I'm looking at this thing, and then you look at this plate. If you put it back in the shelf, it looks new. <laughs> okay, I didn't do that. I didn't do that. I used it again. <laughs> All right, whatever. So anyways, that's what happens. I don't worry about it. That's what happened here in this picture, is that the fire licked up the water. All right. So let's go on. So then they seized them, and Elijah brought them down to the brook. And uh, the prophets of Baal, everybody was, was taken at this point, and then he executed them there. And so he killed them. There's actually more to this story, but um, I was going to go a little further, but I sense the Holy Spirit kind of pausing there. All right. I want us to look at our lives right now. And I want us to pray, and I want us to ask God, do we live this way? Do we have this type of maturity where it's like we can go through difficulty, we can go through triumph, we can go through anything, but we only move on the Word of God. The only thing that we do is we pray all the time, we live poor in spirit, and as you can see with Elijah, he was righteous, he was fervent, and he was mature in Christ at this point. And he was challenged after this, but I, I, I won't get into that today. I mean, go ahead, put your heads down, and I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to let the Lord challenge you. 
to another level. And I, I, I sense that. What I'm sensing is that, I, do, do you have the type of intimacy where if God calls you to lead, you would be able to stand in front of a coliseum where all of the people that were trying to kill you for three years are there and bring the word of God. And we're going to nations, you're going to find out today, that are some of the largest unreached nations of the world, filled with pagans, of pagan gods, filled with all of these demons in the land. And are you at this place where when you're not in a, in a, like a retreat, you know, Jesus love garden, super spiritual prayer filled land, and you're in the middle of darkness, are we strong enough and poor in spirit enough to listen to the word of God and do whatever it says? So Holy Spirit, I ask that you would, you would challenge us right now in this God. And you would talk to us about what it means to follow you, God. I feel like the Lord is going to, um, he's going to speak to you in, uh, in very challenging ways right now. I sense that this whole week, there were certain foxes that came out in our garden. Little compromises that we had. And then we looked at it, and then we didn't take them on. We were in that chapter where the Lord revealed to us a piece of obedience, but we didn't do it. And it could be, it could be something small to somebody else. But to the word of God in your life, that was the word of God. And I want you to ask the Lord, what does it mean when every time you give me a word, I have zero excuses? When every time you speak to me, I'm covered in an impoverished spirit. I'm living in a way that I'm fervent in prayer. And my nature might be like everyone else, but I'm covered in the glory of Jesus because of my prayer life and my spirit with you, God. So just let the Lord speak to you right now. And if he has a, if he has a rebuke for you or a challenge or a point of discipline as a father, he loves you. And he, he wants to be this in your life so that you can mature more and more and more. So God, I ask that you would reveal that right now. Places in our week, God, the word of God in our life that we did not do. And we just open this place up for repentance and hunger and faith, God, in the name of Jesus.